Welcome back to the series on YouTube following baseball legends this day in baseball history. And that is from the Facebook page, Baseball Legends Series, which covers something that happened or multiple things that happened in baseball on that specific day. So this is May 13th version and... I saw this earlier. There's a lot to unpack. It's about the 1950s, a lot of it. 1950s to me, obviously, it was a very important time in American history overall, but just baseball-wise, I consider it the start of what we know as today as modern baseball. And I'll get into that in a little bit, but the post talks about basically the 50s where the New York teams dominated the 50s. The Dodgers and the Yankees won every World Series except for one of them in 1959. But that was the Los Angeles Dodgers winning that World Series, which would have been the Brooklyn Dodgers if the Dodgers didn't head out west. So we'll get into that later. But it was New York's era for baseball. Now, today, well, I should say first that the 50s had possibly the greatest collection of talent you could ever imagine in the batter's box. So the pitchers, I mean, don't get me wrong, you had Warren Spahn and Robert Roberts and, you know, Don Larson through the perfect game. So there's a lot of that too. But the batters, that's what you're focused on when you're talking about the 50s. So one of them, maybe the biggest star, 1955, Mickey Mantle for the first time hit home runs from both sides of the plate in the same game. So that was obviously, you know, again, Mickey Mantle is as talented as anyone on earth. So being a switch hitter and first the Tigers, he had two home runs from the left side and one from the right side. 1958 on May 13th, another unbelievable legend, Stan Musial, Came in as a pinch hitter and recorded his 3,000th hit at the age of 37, which was the youngest player at, to reach the milestone. So, obviously, Stan Musial we'll talk about it a little bit because he had an unbelievable run in the 50s as well. And another guy who's pretty decent, Willie Mays of the Giants. And one of the big debates is Mantle or Mays, Mantle or Mays. So, on this day, basically, he had a huge game against the Dodgers so it's important about that the Giants and Dodgers went out there and basically the giant Dodger rivalry that is so strong today started there because basically they sent them out there to you know kind of compete with each other almost and Mays and his teammate Daryl Spencer had 28 total bases and just you know huge huge line there but Willie Mays had a lot of those the NL MVP of the 58 season and 59 season was Ernie Banks. And on this date in 1969, which again, the thing about the 50s is a lot of guys started their careers. A lot of, some guys ended it, but almost it seems like everybody crossed over the 50s one point or another. Who was anybody during that era, you know, over those like 30 years of baseball, you got you know, possibly, uh, you know, the majority of the greatest players of all time there. So Banks in 69 had his daughter in the crowd and, you know, hit a three-run homer and a double, and the Cubs defeated the Padres 19 to nothing. That game was the first time in 60 years, though, the Cubs shut out their opponents in three consecutive games. Exactly one year later, he was involved in a situation with the Mets where, they mishandled a fly ball that Banks hit in the eighth inning. The official scorer, Jim Enright, ruled it a hit, which cost Gary Gentry a chance at throwing the first no-hitter in Mets history. Now, as a Mets fan, that makes sense because, of course, something weird or went wrong for the Mets when it could have been great. Johan Santana threw the first Mets no-hitter, which is, even for me, like... You know, it doesn't quite feel right now that we have replay and that Beltran ball he hit down the third baseline off Santana late in that game. If there was replay, that ball would be fair, but what are you going to do, right? And obviously, this wasn't the first time we've seen somebody mess up a no-hit bid 
you know, obviously um, Galarraga for the Tigers on the last play where Jim Joyce blew the call at first base, clear, and that was it. And nobody's remembered his name since, not Jim Joyce, the, uh, the pitcher. So question here is, who is the best player in the 1950s? This is a topic that a lot of sports outlets do, like all decade teams. But first thing I want to start with before I get into that and kind of give you my opinion in it, on it is another big thing in baseball happened in the 50s, which not the biggest thing in the world, but just kind of shapes the future now, which is interesting to me. And obviously I'll get into the color batteries and that stuff, which... We need a lot of time for a lot of these things, so I'll just kind of cover them briefly. But sports cards, 1952 tops, you know, that is the baseball card set. So five of the most expensive baseball cards ever sold are from that set, which is really just an, a remarkable situation because when you're talking about baseball cards, you know, a lot of people have fond memories. And nowadays, it's back, you know, Sports Illustrated just wrote about sports cards again. But this set is the mecca. So if you enjoy cards, great. If not, the numbers are kind of amazing. So the first one, 13th most expensive card ever, Hank Aaron, 1954 tops, $357,594. PSA 10, PSA is a grading company. They certify the cards on condition. 10 is a perfect grade, so that obviously changes the price of the condition, but this was a perfect example. Unbelievable, and that's the Milwaukee Braves, Henry Aaron. Number 11, Roberto Clemente, 1955 tops, another PSA 10, $478,000. Number 10, Willie Mays, 1952. So again, that 52 top set, that's the king of all sets in any sports card, in my opinion. You have some of the old tobacco cards and the Gaudi, you know, 1933 stuff. But this is really kind of, in my opinion, the top of the line. So $478,000 cards, not in any condition. Basically, you see the tape there and that type of stuff, which means it's real. But they could not give it a number grade on their scale. But still went for almost a half a million dollars. Unbelievable. So Mickey Mantle, 1951 Bowman, which... $600,000, PSA 10. Unbelievable. But these are what people might be familiar with. So this is the most famous, in my opinion, card besides the Hannes Wagner. But this might even be more you know, interesting to people just because it's Mickey Mantle where Hannes Wagner is one thing. Mickey Mantle is a different thing. But $1.13 million, PSA 8.5. That's the 52 tops. And then the second most um, expensive sports card of um, all time sold, to, and this is accurate to today, was two and two point eight eight million dollars PSA nine, another fifty two tops, but in a little better condition. That's why the price difference. And then the most expensive sports card of all time was, you know, is the Hannes Wagner piece, which went for three point two million dollars. So. Now on to kind of the 50s in general. Number one, color barrier. 47, Jackie Robinson. Really, things weren't integrated for a long time after that, but the 50s started the movement towards basically integration in baseball, and by 59, every single team was integrated, even though it took a little bit because in the beginning of the era – only half of the teams were actually had a black player and that was just basically not good enough considering there was more than enough talent to go around, but there was still obviously segregation in the minds of some of the teams and the players, so it was a little difficult, but this is where Larry Doby came in and obviously as I just talked, like Ernie Banks and Hank Aaron and Willie Mays. I mean, you're talking, imagine you missed out on those guys. I mean, that would be 
the shame of all shame. So by the end of this decade, baseball is integrated, not fully, but every team was integrated to the point where they had at least one black player on it. So that was obviously, again, huge. And those guys during that era, just because it was allowed, it wasn't easy. It was not a great time for them, to be quite honest. And it's just remarkable. to You, you could spend a year just going over all that. But you also, during that era, you saw the first Cuban players, which was uh, one of the mini Mimosa. You also saw the first Dominican player, which was Ozzy Virgil later later on in the late 50s. So things really started to move in the 50s, even though Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in 47. So another obviously important thing that a lot of people might know or might not, everyone knows the Dodgers and Giants moved to San, uh, San Francisco and L.A. from New York. That was a huge story. And the reason that the Dodgers went, because the Dodgers were actually the only team making money in the 50s as a team. So between 52 and 56, they were actually making money. Their owner wanted a new stadium. He had the money for the stadium, but they couldn't get the land situation going. So he actually went to Robert Moses, which you know, was the king of New York. And speaking of a racist man, if you saw the movie with Ed Norton, he was not a great guy. But he was the ruling class here during that era. And basically they couldn't come to an agreement and they went out west. And, uh, you know, so you have it. That was 56. But before that, 1905 till um, I think it was 53, there was no team movement at all. So you had um, a bunch of teams start moving around, and for various reasons. So 54, the Orioles were uh, formed, and you had um, the St. Louis Browns, where the or you know became the Orioles, and then the you know or before that the Boston Braves moved to Milwaukee, and then you also had um, the Athletics. Um, Went from Philadelphia to Kansas City, which obviously Kansas City Royals, Philadelphia Phillies. So a lot of kind of things were moving and shaking. But the Kansas City, um, the Philadelphia to Kansas City one, it was actually the first major league team to get somewhat west, you know, so past the Mississippi. And then that opened the door for a couple years later, the Dodgers and Giants to even consider it. Another thing that opened the door, which was huge, was the way teams traveled prior to this era buses trains you know that's how they got around and sounds ridiculous today considering they got private jets for these guys but that's how it was there was not a lot ton of money you know ted williams salary i think it was 1950 was 125 thousand dollars you know even in inflation terms you're talking under a million dollars for ted williams you know it's unbelievable where I think the major league minimum wage is almost six hundred thousand dollars at this point for somebody you've never heard of. So different times. But what did happen was air travel became much more important and reliable and that's what happened. So that's what allowed teams to start moving around and kinda bettering their financial situation. Another huge thing that happened, which is why I think it's the start of modern baseball, T V really became enhanced so they had a game of the week now the first games of the week were abc and basically abc today and abc back then are two different stories so abc was basically begging teams to, you know to let them show the games and it just didn't go that well for them one of the big things was they were blocking out games within 50 miles of you know the stadium so all the fans of those teams who would actually tune in and watch because you have to remember and these eras everything was so regional you know like i said you know there was plain all that stuff like we just take for granted that we could watch you know the dodgers play the giants at 10 o'clock on espn and it's like nothing 
back then it, that didn't exist. You know, you watch your team and with the American League and the National League, it was like National League people were National League people. American League, like it was just a different, different time. And the fact they had to black out the games for the fans within 50 miles because the owners were worried about attendance figures obviously killed them you know, early on. It ended up being fine for them overall, but that didn't work out. So then CBS took over and NBC got involved. And before you know it, you're talking about games you know, on TV on the weekends and really the start of what we have today with TV contracts and all that type of stuff and networks for teams like the Yankees with Yes and the Mets SNY. Another thing that was big was lights there was no night games until obviously into the 50s um where they became regular so those big giant stadium lights like those weren't in the 1900s those didn't exist so day games so in the 1950s, every team basically had lights in the stadium. That changed things drastically. The only team that didn't play any night games was the Cubs, which they kept that tradition up for a while. And nowadays they'll play night games, but they still play more day games than your average team. So really just a time period that you could look at and say it really revolutionized things between integration improving travel improving finances starting to improve because of obviously the tv contracts and teams getting into better stadiums and in areas where we're more marketable another thing that you know people forget is like the cy young started in 1956 don newcomb um won the first cy young award so before that, when you look at guys like a Walter Johnson and things, and you think about how many Cy Youngs he won, well, he might have had 12, who knows, but 1956 was the first year. 1956, Mickey Mantle also won the Triple Crown, okay? So the main thing with this era was the players because I thought about this all day, and I still am not even sure who I consider the best player. I think I came to a consensus at this point, but really, you could go with a bunch of players. So we'll show you some stats, talk about some guys, and then wrap this up. Because this is a topic that, you know, the point of the blog, um, the YouTube channel here, covering the, the blog and the Facebook, is to expand on things. But some things you just need more time to expand on. So, Yogi Berra. Basically, I took all the guys who I thought could be in that top group of guys, which is a long list. So, Yogi Berra started his career in 46, but if you look at the 50s, number one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13 years in a row to 62, but every year in the 50s he was an all-star he was also mvp three times so again this is baseball reference great website so 51 54 55 couple on that six world series rings and you see all the other mvp number two number two four three and when you look at his numbers you know for a catcher he played every day. He never struck out, which is when you look at these numbers, you say, what is that? What is that for the first weekend of the game? No, this is the whole season. I mean, you're talking 20 times, 24 times strikeouts. Unbelievable. But power, RBIs, just average. I mean, look at, uh, you know, you got a catcher playing every day back then. Who's hitting almost 300 who's hitting 25 plus home runs who's driving in runs who's just amazing so he's in consideration some people though don't consider him the best catcher even in this era even though you can make a case for him being 
you know, one of the best players or the best player in the era, you know, it, it's not going to happen. You know, you're not going to win that argument, but you can make the case if you felt like it. Some people make the case for Roy Campanella being the best catcher and one of the best players in this time. And we look at Roy, you know, again, the majority, he only played uh, two years in the 40s, so he really was the 50s and he had a shorter 10-year career. But look at some of these years. I mean, look at 1953 here. He won the MVP. He also won the MVP in 51 and what was that? 55. So, but look at this year. Catcher again. 41 home runs, 142 RBIs, 312 average. I mean, where else besides a couple years over the last you know, 60 years, do you see a, uh, a year like that for a catcher? And one of the things about Campanella is you see in here like 207, you know, he had some off years every once in a while, 219, like mixed in. So 318, 32, 107, then 219, 20, 73, and then he ended his career, you know, at 316. But some of these off years that you'll see, he had nerve damage in his pinky and also it was said that he tore his hamstring in uh, one of the early world series he played so who knows how much better his stats would have looked if he wasn't dealing with injuries and just playing through them and back then i mean that was obviously very common but it hurt him as a catcher and then unfortunately later on you know he had the ultimate accident and injury and got paralyzed but three mvps three world series titles i mean again this is an argument you can make just between these two forget about the rest of them just these two unbelievable so another guy that is really in the debate stand usual, so 1950. I mean, again, you're talking huge. See, I mean, look at these years. 346, 355, 336, 330. I mean, this is unbelievable. Now, 1957, this is how good the, A guy hit 351, 29, 102, and didn't win the MVP, okay? I mean, how unlucky... Look at these years, you know, again, consider the home run numbers when you see 28, like that's nothing when today's like 28. I mean, you're talking that's like 38 today. OK, so 346, 28, 109 didn't win the MVP. All right. He obviously up here in the 40s won a couple MVPs, three of them, actually. But he couldn't quite get over the hump with some of the other guys. But some of these years are absurd. Okay, one guy that was kind of in limbo here, Ted Williams. So I talked about Ted Williams the other day, but he left here for World War II, obviously military service, and then 52, Korean War, again. So you see he only played 37 and six games between 52 and 53, and... You know, that was kind of it for him, quite honestly, because as you see here, you know, he just kind of, I mean, he had big years, very big years, but the road was ending. He only played five, basically five more years, full years, if you add them up here, but 98 games, you know, obviously this, so 103. So he's kind of at the edge. He still could hit. Don't get me wrong. But he was not the same player. But when you say that and a guy still hit 388 with 38, it's like, what? But he'll even, you know, he admitted it, you know, when he was actually talking to people that he felt that war service, the Korean War stuff, really hurt what he could have done so when you look at what you know look at these numbers 345 356 345 388 he thought that was nothing and obviously when you see up here you know 406 you know he thought 
he really got robbed. So Ted Williams, unbelievable, but he's not even close to one of the best players in this era overall, which is kind of crazy when you think about it, considering some of the other guys who put up numbers there. The big name, obviously, that everybody knows one way or another, Jackie Robinson. So, again, 40-70 started, but 50, all-star, 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 all-star. And Jackie Robinson, I think people who don't know him besides, obviously, for the color barrier, like they just think of him stealing home. But he didn't steal a ton of bases. This arrow was not, you know, run around the bases, not like – Definitely not like the 80s, but kind of stealing bases wasn't something that happened a lot, as you could see that. So he stole 37 here, which is extremely unusual. Hit 342, won the MVP. But then kind of the power-minded guys, I guess, basically trying to take a chance on the bases was not part of the game. And you see, you know, not a lot of steals totals, but again, High average, you know, some mixed years in there. Not a ton of power, but it doesn't matter what he did on the field. It was what he did from off the field to get on the field and then what he dealt with. So who knows if he had a fair chance really to just perform and not deal with everything else under the sun, what his numbers would have been. But to even be able to do this with what he dealt with, that's the most remarkable part. So if somebody said Jackie Robinson was the best player of the 50s because of what he dealt with and he still was able to perform at a high level, I would not be able to really argue that. So Ernie Banks, we talked about earlier. Again, 58 and 59, he won two MVPs. So you had Campanella, three. Yogi Berra, three. Ernie Banks, two at the end here. And he started in 53, but... 47, 129, 313, 45, 143. You know, big, big power numbers. I mean, these numbers look impressive for any power era. So Ernie Banks there. And what do I want to go to next? So Willie Mays. So the big debate gets down to Willie Mays and Mickey Mantle. And there's one other guy that I'm saving for a minute because I think he gets forgotten because of all these other guys but Willie Mays started obviously 1951 he's 20 years old played a hundred years but the 50s really you know had some real good years for him so 50 uh was it 54 he was the MVP in National League 345 41, 110. Now, again, you see here, earlier, obviously, he was a rookie. He went to military service as well. And the stole, stolen bases aren't, you know, tremendous. And then all of a sudden, you know, he started to run. So, again, you could see kind of the trend there is that steals weren't that important. But Willie Mays was... Willie Mays, so guess what? He kind of had the green light. So 333, 347. I mean, power, speed. One of the most famous catches of all time. The one where he's going back and over his shoulder. That was 54, the World Series. You know, another, obviously, maybe more of an overall famous moment was, you know, um, the shot heard around the world, Bobby Thompson. So really just you could just rattle off things that you think of with this era, but huge numbers for Mays. And then Mickey Mantle, which started in 51 as well at 19. And you see some of these years just like 350, 352, 130, 132 runs and 150 games plus – the walks total, so that's a big, big difference, you know, 113. He walked a ton where somebody like Willie Mays, when you compare him, not nearly as much. Strikeouts low, but walks low. And Mantle was a guy who obviously struck out a lot more, but he also walked a lot more. So Mantle, 
just looking at it offensively, is more of your prototypical power hitter today than Willie Mays just because nobody hits 40 home runs and strikes out 60 times in the year. So just the strikeouts. Obviously, his average, you know, there's very few guys who've ever even thought about hitting some of these numbers, but 353, 365, I mean, these years are just absurd. You know, MVP, MVP, All-Star. And back then, they had two All-Star games. So if you notice in the history books, if you ever look at this time period, some guys had more All-Star games than years. But that's because there was two All-Star games. And I don't exactly know the reason for that, but I saw that. So interesting stuff there. But Mantle and Mays. They had it all, power, speed, grace, intelligence. Like, these were the two guys. Now, wrap this up with a gentleman who, quite honestly, I'd say, unfortunately, 90% of new baseball fans, so like, let's say, people who are either... You know, young kids, like 10 years old, let's say, but up until about 40 years old, are not even aware Duke Schneider was alive. Now, I was always aware because my grandparents grew up in Brooklyn, Brooklyn Dodger fans, Epic Field, like Gil Hodges, Pee Wee Reese, Jackie Robinson, Duke Schneider, like that was so, like, they became Met fans after, but it was never, like, they never got over the Dodgers leaving i mean that was just devastating and a lot of people felt the same way but duke schneider you know you can kind of go back and forth you know between cabanella and schneider and Gahad, like who was the most important to those teams but look at these years for a guy that nobody even talks about all right and if you notice here you see he didn't didn't win any mvps this is how good the the, the league was but again you if you had a guy today Score 132 runs, hit 38 doubles, hit 42 home runs, 126 RBIs, steal 16 bases, only strike out 90 times, and hit 336 with over a 400 on base and over a thousand OPS, and he came in third in the MVP voting. You would say that is impossible. On top of that, he was playing on one of the best teams of the era, and while he was putting up these monstrous numbers. They won three World Series. So, and then again, another one, you know, when they went out to L.A. So four World Series in this era for him and no MVPs. And really, I think they could have maybe thrown him one because it wasn't like it was one year fluke, okay? 341, 40, 130, 39. 309, 42, 136, 43, 29. Like, these are just guys that when you look at baseball history, you're just like, really? Like, that's unbelievable. Like, a guy I'm leaving out just because we don't, how, I could talk about this for 10 years. You, know, you had uh, Eddie Matthews, you had Ralph Kiner, who had over 50 home runs, you know, in this era. Okay, I'll, I'll just bring up Ralph Kiner for a second because Ralph Kiner is another guy who, you know, Kiner's corner people remember, but who, who remembers how great of a power hitter this guy was? I mean, look at the, you know, 49, 54, but 50, 47, 42, 37. Like, there's a guy who nobody talks about. But look at the 51, 40, 54, 47. Like, look at this stretch right here on top of hitting over or in the area of 300 on average, basically, for these years. And striking out, hitting 51, 51 home runs and 81 strikeouts over a 152-game season. If somebody did that today, they'd be inducted in the Hall of Fame after the season was over. But, again, that's just how much talent. I mean, look at this year in 1949. 54 home runs, 
127 RBIs, 310, and he came in fourth in the MVP voting. So this entire era was crazy. The 50s we focused on, but you could go on and on and on about the guys. Joe DiMaggio played in the 50s as well. He retired in 51, like I said before, but pitcher-wise... You have Warren Spahn and Robin Roberts. And really one of the interesting things about the 50s was, well, I might start a little earlier, but like Hoyt Wilhelm, like the relievers started to become more of a strategy instead of just a mop to mop up the mess that the starting pitcher made. And that's another transition, obviously took a long time to where it is today, but where relievers started to be used because it was a game plan not because they had to use them because guys were throwing over 300 innings. I mean, there just was no innings to relieve and then things started to change a little bit. So you had Robin, you know, speaking of 300 innings, Robin Roberts, Warren Spahn, and, you know, those were the two best pitchers of the era. So we'll just leave it at that. But who do I think was the best player of the 50s after looking at all this stuff? I would have to go with Mickey Mantle for a couple reasons. I know the Mays Mantle debate is endless. One thing I do agree with that people say is that the National League was a much tougher league because of the integration. And obviously that's probably true, but there's no way to prove that. So we'll just leave it at that. But Mantle and those Yankees, like, they won so much that I just don't see how you could give it to anyone else besides a Yankee, especially when the Yankees of that era put up the most numbers as anybody also. Like Yogi Berra, three MVPs, six titles, and he also, you know, the Campanella debate, but he had more stats than Campanella during that time. So, Mantle, for me, numbers, the fact that the Yankees were the team, they won the most, I would have to side with him. But it's an endless debate. Like, somebody in the post said Stan Musial. Like, Stan Musial is a great, like, hard to argue of why not. Like, Stan Musial numbers line up just as well. It's just the winning, and that era was so dominated by, you know, the Dodgers and the Yankees that I would have to go with a Dodger or Yankee because everything else really, you know, number for number, you can make arguments for a lot of guys. But Mickey Mantle and Mays, and then I, you know, honestly, Duke Schneider deserves to be in the conversation, he was not nearly as good as those guys. He put up huge numbers, but he was not the same dynamic player and, you know, just impactful person on a team. But he's the other guy and Campanella that you mix into, like, who was the most important to their team in that era between Dodgers and Yankees. So you got Berra, Mantle, Campanella... Gil Hodges, Jackie Robinson, Duke Schneider. So you got that group. And then you have, obviously, the African-American players who started to emerge and get a chance. And, oh, by the way, <laughs> see, this is how crazy this era is. Hank Aaron played. <laughs> I almost forgot, which is kind of crazy. You forget about Hank Aaron. But Hank Aaron started in 54. Obviously, I showed you the baseball card. But he started off a little slow but by 57 44 132 322 won the mvp and then it was just hank aaron from that point forward but that 59 season again third in the mvp 355 average 39 home runs 123 46 doubles over 100 like and he came in third in the mvp voting so I'm sure I even forgot a, a bunch of other guys, but I literally almost forgot Hank Aaron. That's how crazy this era is. So 
I'm going to end it here because this could go on for, for days. But at some point, I'm sure we'll be talking a lot more about the 50s multiple times just because of the star power. And maybe we'll expand on this topic fully because I know I left out a lot of stuff. There's just that much stuff. So hope you enjoyed it. I will see you all tomorrow.